I'm going to be getting into Galatians, but first today, uh, we're going to be looking at some scripture in Hebrews. Now, as you know, I've put out quite a number of videos regarding Jesus Christ being the eternal Son of God. It's been attacked by many, misunderstood by some, but Jesus has always been the Son of God. He did not become the Son of God. He is not, as the false teachers say, the Word of God who becomes the Son of God. He's always been both. And even when you have clear passages in Hebrews uh, that show that, that Jesus Christ does not change. For example, at the end of uh, Hebrews in chapter 13, verse 8, we read, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Now, I want you to understand that verse is really a culmination of what the Apostle Paul was presenting to us through the entire epistle of Hebrews in relation to who Jesus Christ is. It is the summary. But when you delve into these chapters that tie in Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, with his priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, you see that, that it is an eternal position. It doesn't change. He is who he is. This is his nature. He says in the Old Testament, I am that I am. He is the self-existent, sustaining God who does not change. He does not alter. He says in the Old Testament in Malachi, I am the Lord, I change not. And we're going to look at some scripture here, beginning in Hebrews chapter 5, um, in relation to this Melchizedek priesthood. Now, before I do so, I want to point out that um, one false religion known as the Mormons um, confer these priesthoods, the Aaronic and the Melchizedek, upon their elders and make them elders in their um, false church. Um, they begin with the Aaronic priesthood, they called it the lesser, and then the greater one is the Melchizedek priesthood. Well, there's no one on earth that can be that priest. Only Jesus Christ fulfills it because he is from eternity past. You see, if he were not the eternal Son of God, he could not be um, after the order of Melchizedek. And we're going to look at this here beginning in chapter 5. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. So we understand that the high priest in the Old Testament was a temporary position. It was the Aaronic priesthood. It was um, Aaron was um, commanded by the Lord to do this position, to begin this priesthood. And it was Moses, remember, who uh, would put the blood on his ear and on his thumb and on his great toe and um, goes through all these rituals to become the high priest at the commandment of the Lord. That's important to understand. Nobody can of themselves take upon this priesthood. Uh, that's one of the many, many errors of the Mormons, other than having a false Jesus and a false gospel where you have to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps to work your way to heaven. Uh, but anyways, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. You see, that office of Aaron for him was temporary. God was already speaking in the Old Testament, particularly uh, in Exodus and Leviticus, about how it would be Aaron and for his sons after him that somebody else would have to take his place because Aaron wasn't going to live forever in that position. Um, all of this was temporary and and really it does tie in with Galatians because it completes to the, uh, it points to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and how he fulfilled the law and he met all the requirements, everything in the Old Testament perfectly. And therefore only he could be our sacrifice for sins. Only he could fulfill God's will 
up on the cross. Only he could satisfy the judgment that was required and uh, provide atonement for the sins of mankind. We understand through Galatians and even here in, in chapter 5 that, that at no point could this um, ironic priesthood, this lineage of high priests, um, permanently do anything to offer um, eternal salvation to those who were under the law. The law is the schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. That law is a mirror that is held up in front of our face and says, you're guilty. You're guilty before God. And so therefore, knowing that Jesus Christ paid for everything, we trust him for salvation. It's that simple. For that he himself also is compassed with infirmity, and by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. You see, Aaron sinned, but Jesus Christ, our glorious Savior, in him was found no guile. Aaron, he went astray with the children of Israel. Remember when Moses went up onto the mount, Mount Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai, and spoke with God face to face. And Aaron uh, made the golden calves and they worshiped down there at the foot of the mountain. And then they rose up to play. And Aaron partook of that. So there must needs be a sacrifice for the high priest. And that is all detailed in the Old Testament in the law, how the priest would make atonement for himself before he made one for the people. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So Aaron didn't come up with this on his own. This is a requirement of God for the children of Israel under the law. Now look at verse 5. Oh, verse 5, brothers and sisters, is just rich with truth and goodness. Um, so very deep. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. You see how that verse shows up again? Now, we of course know that verse from the Old Testament in the Psalms. We know it from um, Acts chapter 13. But here we see the Father speaking and saying, But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Now, one would suppose those with shallow minds, those without true wisdom and understanding in Holy Scripture, who fill their cells with a lot of head knowledge of books, rather than letting Scripture interpret Scripture and allowing the Holy Spirit to teach them. But because they're choking on their own pride, they will not see, just like the Pharisees of old, they're no different. They will not see that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God from eternity past. He has always been so. The Father has always been the Father. Uh, they have not changed. That relationship has been from all of eternity. Jesus Christ, eternally begotten, he, that means he proceeds forth from the Father to declare the Father to us. Um, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, remember this ties in with, with uh, Hebrews 13. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. And forever is forever. You have a bunch of scripture twisters that take those words and they take the scripture and they twist it apart and they, they, they wrench away the truth from it and they exchange the truth of God for a lie. And they worship the creature more than the creator who was blessed forever, amen. And when these people take this scripture, they do a great disservice to their listeners and they blaspheme the living God. 
as he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, because he has been our high priest from eternity past. He has always been. This is who he is. You see, look back in, in Isaiah. Isaiah 55. And verses, let's begin in verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, God knew us even from eternity past. That's not to say, like the Mormons teach, that we were physically there. And there are many things that we do not understand. For now we look through a glass darkly, but then face to face. But what I am saying is that every thought to God is real. He doesn't daydream. He doesn't wish upon a star. His thoughts are real. Um, everything that he thinks is real is true. It comes to pass. Um, the word that goes forth out of his mouth does not come back void. Um, and the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. It's all for his glory. He speaks that which comes to pass. That's why Jesus is the word of God. He's always the word of God. He's always the son of God. He is not the word who becomes the son. He doesn't cease to become uh, the word of God to become the son of God. He is both forever. And look what it says here. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. His priesthood is out of this world. It's not earthly. It's from above. It is not just some finite time period. Um, it is for all of eternity. You see, that is why the Aaronic priesthood could never take away sin. It was going to fail because... It was operated by men who were sinners. But yet Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, in whose mouth was found no guile, he was sinless, perfect, holy. He was the just one who, as Peter said, was evidently crucified before you. Look at verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh... When he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet he learned by obedience the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, after the order of Melchizedek, it is far superior to the priesthood of Aaron. It's a temporary thing. And it could never accomplish what Jesus Christ accomplished. Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you're a dull of hearing. For when the time, for when the, for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Now, let's look farther into this and go to the next chapter, chapter 6. Verse 13, For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. See, that puts an end to the matter. Um, God, who promises, who cannot lie, who never breaks his word, his word puts an end to the matter. It is thus saith the Lord, and that's it. 
There is no need to go beyond. Uh, we have so many false teachers that go beyond the word of the Lord that add to the word of God who will say terrible things that Jesus Christ is not the eternal Son of God and they will teach that he became the Son of God at his incarnation and that hell doesn't really burn forever. Um, all these false teachings are going to be found uh, weighed in the balance and found wanting. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus Christ being after the order of Melchizedek. Now that is not to say that the Melchizedek in the Old Testament was Jesus Christ who became um, reincarnated somehow. Um, this is another false teaching put out by a false teacher that uh, Melchizedek was literally Jesus Christ. He's a type of Christ. Okay, He has qualities about him that are going to be revealed here in... Um, in chapter 7 where the characteristics of Melchizedek in the Old Testament really point to Christ just like there's things about Moses that point to Christ there's things about David there's things about Joseph in Egypt all of these point to Christ and Christ fulfills them for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness. See, that points to Christ. He is the king of righteousness. Um, and the millennium, things will be inscribed that says, The Lord our righteousness, which is king of peace without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. You see, Melchizedek showed up as Melchizedek, and Jesus showed up in the Old Testament to Abraham as Jesus. But there are characteristics about him where he is obscure. We don't, we're not told anything about this Melchizedek. But um, nonetheless, these things are brought forth here by the Apostle Paul to point us to Christ. Now, verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, this is very important, right here, not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. You see, if Jesus was not the eternal Son of God, he never would have qualified for this order of, after the order of Melchizedek. He wouldn't have been qualified to be this high priest and to fulfill this. Only as the Son of God could he do so. And if he had become the Son of God, he would have been a temporary Son of God. Even if, even if you want to argue, well, well, he'll be the Son of God for all of eternity, but these incarnational sonship people do not say that. They lie. 
they say, well, he's going to revert back to the Word. So if he was indeed temporary as a son, then he would have to be temporary as after the order of Melchizedek to do all that he did. It is only because of his eternality, of his eternal sonship, that he could fulfill all of this. And he is the only one who could. It was not the Father that died on the cross. It was not the Holy Spirit. It was Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God. He is the one who died on the cross, who shed his blood, who paid the price for man's sin. It is he who fulfilled scripture, and he alone. There is salvation in no other name. There is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. It is only Jesus Christ. And you better make sure, brothers and sisters, that you have the true one. Because there are false Christs, Jesus warned us, that many false Christs would abound. And that is indeed what has happened. And it's so subtle. It's so subtle. People think, well, you know, why do you want to argue over uh, eternal sonship? Uh, we got the same Jesus. No, we don't. We absolutely do not. A Jesus who becomes the Son of God at his incarnation could never fulfill the requirements of what Jesus did here after the order of Melchizedek. He could not. He wouldn't qualify. Because we already see how the failure of the Aaronic priesthood, that it could never take away man's sin. It was weak. It had its limitations. Because look what it says once again. Who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, because the more you're aware of commandments, the more you sin. The more you know about God's law, the more it's revealed to you, the more you see yourself for who you really are. And so the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It's only there as a mirror to show us this is God's requirement. Can you meet God's holy standard? Jesus did. But you can put your trust in him. And therefore, when you do, all of his righteousness, all of his goodness, is transferred to you and you are now adopted as as God's child Romans chapter 8 who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment but after the power of an endless life see his life is endless and our life is hid in Christ and our life is endless we are his sons and his daughters forever and he is after the order of Melchizedek, what he did is forever. Who he is is forever. He does not become the Son of God to do this work. He has always been. And he fulfilled all things because he is from eternity past. He is who he is. And he proceeds forth from the bosom of the Father to show the Father to us. For he testifieth that thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannuling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did. Listen, brothers and sisters, I cannot stress this enough. If Jesus Christ is not the eternal Son of God, I have absolutely zero hope. I am completely and utterly and totally hopeless. I am devoid of any hope whatsoever, not even the smallest, tiny amount of hope if Jesus Christ is not the eternal Son of God. If he is not who he says he is, and he is somehow less than he is not who he says he is. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. You say they die, but Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. If he was not the eternal Son of God, he wouldn't have been any more superior than the Aaronic priesthood. If he was one who becomes the Son of God, then he would be limited. And yet, 
He is not. He is above the Aaronic priesthood. There's no limitations to him. And I know the argument, the foolish, silly, wicked argument that these uh, incarnational sonship people will say, well, he's always been God from all of eternity, so your, um, so your reasoning is devoid. No, it's not. Because if he's not the eternal son of God from all of eternity, he's nothing. You just made up a God and a false God at that. So he is either who he says he is or he's not. Jesus Christ is either the eternal son of God or he's a fraudulent liar. And that's where the incarnational sonship people are. Jesus said, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. But this man, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Because he's the unchangeable son of God. If he became the son of God at his incarnation, he would have had a temporary priesthood. It's just that simple. And therefore he would not have qualified. For such an high priest became us who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did wants when he offered up himself this high priest offered himself as the sacrifice just as it foreshadowed all the way back to Abraham and Isaac when uh, Isaac asked his father you know where is the lamb for the offering and he says God shall provide himself a lamb and he certainly did he himself the lamb of God provided for the sins of the world and only he could do it for the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore he is always the son forevermore and that is what this is all about this wrapping up of of Jesus Christ tying in with the um, with the scripture that says thou art my son today have I begotten thee it is a consecration of who he is it is a revealing to the world this is my son does that sound familiar yes the father spoke it from heaven did he not in the ears of witnesses this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And yet, brothers and sisters, sadly, many will not. They have itching ears. Oh, they would rather follow after a man than be hungry for the word of God and study it for themselves. They would rather follow after somebody who constantly just wants to stir up strife and, and bicker and fight amongst all the different channels and point out every tiny, minute, supposed little error rather than focus on the Word of God and teaching it. And while it is true that people do need to be exposed to a certain extent, uh, there are some people who do nothing but that. And it's because they don't know anything else. They don't really know, um, they don't really believe what the Word of God says. They know they've been told, but they don't believe it. They have rejected the truth. And anyone that can walk away from the truth that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son and that only He could qualify to be that high priest after the order of Melchizedek clearly does not know their Bible.